What's the word, y'all? I gotta be the very last NBA YouTuber out there on the planet to give us opinions about the trade deadline. But listen, I was in San Francisco on work, and, and, and I tried my hardest. I swear to you, I tried my hardest to get a video out to y'all like minutes after it ended, right? I'm in San Francisco. I knew that this trip was gonna fall into the day. First of all, this trip got rescheduled three different times. First, Mike entered Health and Safety Protocol. Then I did. And then we had a huge snowstorm in Chicago. All of those times, I should have been in San Francisco. Okay, we get there, right? And I see that it falls on trade deadline day. I'm like, you know what? I'm gonna take my camera, my, my microphone, my editing equipment. I'm gonna take everything I need. Didn't take lighting. Hotel lighting, trash. Hotel Wi-Fi, trash. And I was like, you know what? The people can wait. You know what I'm saying? My flight is Friday morning. I'll get home, get the video out there, and, and nobody will, will really realize that I didn't get it out on the original day, right? And then my flight gets delayed by three hours. So here I am, 8 o'clock on a Friday, finally talking about yesterday's trade. It hurt my heart, man, because y'all know I'm a trade dude. So once we get some of the biggest names in the NBA get moved, I want to talk about it. So here I am, finally talking about it. Be sure to leave a like. Subscribe if you're new. Even if you disagree with everything I said in this video, that's completely okay. It is just sports at the end of the day. In this video, I will be talking about every single trade one way or another. Some might take 30 seconds. Some might take 15 minutes. I don't really know. I'm just rambling around here. Let me let y'all in on a little something. Literal minutes before the James Harden trade officially broke, I tweeted 30 eyes emoji. And it was like, Kenny, how did you know? I did it. It was it was complete. <laughs> I ain't got no sources, bro. It was complete luck. You feel me? It was complete luck. But you know, I may add that to my NBA resume, ladies and gentlemen. If you don't know what the trade entails, Ben Simmons, Seth Curry, Andre Drummond, a 2022 first round pick, a 2027 first round pick, top eight protected, whatever, for James Harden and Paul Millsap, the blockbuster trade of this deadline. And you know what? Before we even talk about this trade, I went on to Twitter 10 minutes after the trade deadline ended, and I asked the people, what would you rate this trade deadline on a scale of 1 to 10? And I saw a lot of people giving it sub 7. We seeing some fives. I'm like, where? What? James Harden, Ben Simmons, Demontis Sabonis, Karis LeVert, Montrez Harrell, Porzingis. You feel me? See, did I say CJ McCollum, Tyrese Halliburton? We had some really big trades go down. So I don't, I think, you know what I think it was? I think because y'all are so used to the buzzer beat of trade at the deadline. Since we had zero, y'all were a bit upset about it. You, you remember that one year where out of nowhere, Isaiah Thomas, Goran Dragic, and, and Isaiah Thomas, Goran Dragic, I think Brandon Knight was in that trade. It was like seven point guards all into one trade at the last minute of the deadline. Y'all were used to that. We didn't get that this season. But we did get some of the biggest names in basketball going to their next teams, right? So let's talk about the Ben Simmons, James Harden trade, because I, I just feel like this is, how, how do I want to say it? There's a lot more nuance to this rather than the sense. It's like, ah, oh, everybody got what they wanted, so that's a W. Let's move on to the next. There's a lot of more, let's, way more nuance to this trade than just that. On paper, I think both of these teams improve one way or another. Start off with the 76ers. They have that secondary star. Joel Embiid is having an MVP caliber season. And though James Harden has been a roller coaster of performances this season, he is still a really good player. And what we have found out over the last year or two of James Harden, if he don't want to be somewhere, you're going to know. That game a couple nights ago where he had four total points or whatever it was before they start sitting him because they were going to trade him. He had like four total points. You watch that game, you can tell bro was disinterested with the game of basketball. He was disinterested with being on this team, right? But when he is locked in, he should, look, he does the same thing every season. When he basically told the world in Houston, I've done everything I could do for this city. I think in the very first game, one of the first games of the season, he had like a 40-point triple double, something similar. Don't fact check me again. I'm just a ramble at the end of the day. He had an amazing game just to show people. I can't hoop. I'm just not going to right now. And then he started to play like trash. He does the same thing this year. Everybody's talking about, oh, James Harden's washed. He's super out of shape. He did this. And he had a week where he was averaging like a 30-point triple-double. He's like, okay, I can still hoop. But now I'm just not going to because I don't really like my situation right now. And I just think adding a guy like James Harden raises the playoff ceiling for the 76. Of course, we got to see how it works on court and everything. But like before the trade deadline, in my mind, there were three real-life championship contenders in the Eastern Conference. It was the Milwaukee Bucks. It was the Miami Heat. And it was the Brooklyn Nets. After this, I can confidently say with the upper end talent named James Harden that the 76ers add their way to like a team that can win the conference, which is always good. You know what I'm saying? Daryl Morey for the entire year was telling the world, I'm not going to settle. I'm not going to settle. And people were telling him to settle, me included. Like I saw a package of, of or Tyrese Halliburton, Buddy Heald, and, and Harrison Barnes. No, you ain't get the top end talent player, but you got some really nice pieces. And he stuck with his guns and he got his guy, obviously, Daryl Morey. James Harden are like this, you feel me? So he got his guy. Now, how do they fit on court? James Harden and Joel Embiid, it's going to be something to be seen. Because 
I, everybody in the league stands around. That is, the, I know every time I talk about players that stand on offense when they don't have the ball, people are like, Kenny, everybody stands. You're absolutely right. But when you're a t as talented as James Harden slash Trey Young slash, who are some other players that I always criticize for just standing around? If you are as talented as those dudes and you're not making yourself an option when you don't have the ball, you're doing a disservice to your team and your own stat line, bro. If James Harden became an elite level cutter, which sometimes he could be, or he showed sometimes his career, we talking super early in James Harden's career, by the way, when he was the sixth man of the year. If he became a cutter, or he just did anything off the ball, that is raising the ceiling of the offense and the team. But James Harden has showed us year in after year, if he ain't got the ball in his hands, he's not that much of a threat. Because he will sit at the, at the hash, five feet behind the three-point line, which yeah, I guess he can hit that shot. But if I'm a defender, I'm okay with him attempting that shot. You know what I'm saying? And James Harden is a dude that is a heliocentric guy. And Joel Embiid is having the best season of his career. So how do they balance having the full effect that is James Harden? Because at the end of the day, even if he's only playing 85% of what he normally does, he is still one of the top 10 players in the league. I'm not about to make a list, but you get what I'm saying. How do you get the best version of him and the best version of Joel Embiid to have them click with 20-something games left for the season to get them ready for the playoff time? And maybe they don't. And maybe this is a, this is they have these something games to to be a learning curve for them. So next year, once they might dump off Tobias Harris's contract, because that seems like something they want to do in the offseason, they can build another version of this team with Joel and 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 James Harden work together better. But it's gonna be weird, man. James Harden has never played with this dominant of a center center that's not like a crazy lob threat. Can Joel Embiid go get some lobs? Sure. He ain't Clint Capella athletic when it comes to verticality. He ain't Dwight Howard when it comes to verticality. So how do you how do you do it? Joel Embiid likes to be on the short row. He's not necessarily a dive to the rim type dude. But James Harden is a killer in the, in the pick and roll. So Doc Rivers has his hands full to figure it out. But you got time. You know, James Harden picked up that player option. You can decide for yourself. You think James Harden is like declining as his productivity? Only time will tell, man. If, if he is happy, I can see James Harden being back to, like, the super, superstar player that we see a lot of times. But, again, shout out to Daryl Moore. He got his guy. Did he give up a lot to get it? Hell, yeah, he did. But if he had his eyes set on James Harden and that was the guy he wanted, him getting it is a W. The man was in and out on uh, radio stations everywhere saying, we not settling. And they didn't. So, on paper, you can see a world where the Philadelphia 76ers are better just because you're getting some productivity from a, a non-spot that was Ben Simmons. But on the other side of things, it's interesting too, man. It's very, very interesting. I think, depending on, listen, there's been a lot of reports about Ben Simmons, whether he might be traveling for this upcoming road trip. I don't really know. Um, this, in, in my personal opinion, the Brooklyn Nets, on paper, is like the perfect place for Ben, right? Because if he was going to any other team that was rumored to be associated with him, whether it be the Sacramento Kings, they were expecting him to be a superstar level player. With Brooklyn, you don't necessarily need to do that every night. Maybe every other night because one of your superstar players ain't playing at home. But this is the type of role that I think Ben Simmons could, could, could really get into. And there's not a lot of pressure. When he was with the 76ers, he was looked to be the second best player. Here... Nah, but there are so many different options for Ben Simmons to do the things that Ben Simmons can do. I remember when all of this first started, and whether or not it be a true report or whatever, I remember reading a report that Ben Simmons wants to have a team similar to what Giannis have, where he is the number one guy and it's just built around him. It was just completely unrealistic at the end of the day. For a team that is trying to win a championship or trying to trade assets for you, Ben, they're not going to build their team around. You just haven't showed enough that you could be the Giannis-type, heliocentric, drive-to-the-rim, orchestrate-everything type dude. But here it's a little bit different because they got nothing but shooters. And they're going to have a lot of opportunities for you to get that ball at the glass and go coast to coast. You play great defense, which this team needs, because one of the big things about the Brooklyn Nets is that they, they haven't been able to, to put together great defensive, um, I was about to say great defensive series, but that's not necessarily true. That first series against the, the what was it, the Boston Celtics last year, where you actually did have the big three together, the defense wasn't bad at all. Um, but they have like a defensive anchor, and that is Ben Simmons, right? So you play great defense, you grab the ball off the rim and run, and you find shooters. You have Seth Curry on the team. You have Kevin Durant, Kyrie Irving, Joe Harris going to be back eventually. That lineup with Ben Simmons. All of those shooters of Ben Simmons could be crazy. Now, I'm not saying run through Ben Simmons because you got KD and you got Kyrie, but there's not going to be a ton of pressure on Ben because if I am the GM of the Brooklyn Nets or I am the, the, the coach of the Brooklyn Nets, I'm not expecting Ben to do anything other than get the ball off the rim and run. Play great defense. 
everything else will run its course. We have potentially the greatest scorer of all time, one of the most skilled scorers of all time on your wings. We don't need you to do anything else. So in that point, it's a W. And honestly, the fact that they got Seth Curry, Andre Drummond, and two first round picks considering the circumstances is amazing to me. It's amazing to me. Because you got to think about it. The world knew whether or not James Harden wanted you to believe it or not. Every NBA fan out there, every NBA GM, GM out there knew that James Harden wanted to be traded. So uh, the Brooklyn Nets didn't really have a ton of leverage. And they turned it into a, one of the best defensive players in the league. One of the greatest, if not the greatest spot. Uh, one of the greatest shooters of all time percentage-wise. I think Seth Curry's actually number one. Um, Andre Drummond, who might be the best backup center in the league. You can argue between him, Montrez Hero, and a couple different dudes. Regardless, uh, Drummond is a really good backup center. And then picks. Not that bad, considering you, you, they gave up so much to get James. This is just like a little package. It's like, okay, now we feel okay. At least we didn't lose him in free agency. You know? It's just so weird to me that this team played a total of 16 games together in 13 months. Was it 13 months? Six games together. 16 games together in 13 months. This is what I'm telling myself. I will not, in the future of me being an NBA fan, see a super team be formed and immediately say it's wraps. Because more likely than not, it's not. You know what I'm saying? There are so many things that go into building the perfect roster. It's not just get the best stars. You got to think about personalities. You got to think about so many different things. And from every account I've seen, James Harden butted heads with a lot of different people in that organization, a lot of different people in that locker room. It wasn't just let's get the best possible players. Only time will tell, but this feels like one of those rare big level trades that I can say both teams won um we'll see I mean Philly got their guy that's their W and Brooklyn got something for a dude that didn't want to be there that's a W you know I feel like there's way more that I want to say about this particular trade we're gonna move on and if it comes to mind we can we can always double back baby this is basically a podcast at this point Poor Zingas got traded out of nowhere as well Spencer Dinwiddie Davis Bird test for Poor Zingas in the second rounder now this one might have been if no this one was the most confusing slash surprising trade of the entire deadline in my opinion we already knew that the other trade was going through or not that it was going through but they had conversations about ben simmons and james harden this one is a left fielder and i i've been trying to rack my brain around it from from both parties honestly i've been trying to wrap my brain around it from both parties talk about the the dallas mavericks i mean this is the only thing i can think about they got one less year on contracts because they get, got rid of Porzingis. And they were just tired of the Porzingis experience. What I mean is, this dude will have stretches where he looks like the unicorn, that they, you know, the nickname that they gave him. And then he missed 16 games. They saw him as a potential number two option to Luka, and they gave up a ton to get him. But it never became a reality because bro couldn't stay healthy. And that felt... I think this is the second time I'm using this. This felt like a cloud maybe over, over the organization. Like, hey, poor Zingas has missed 20 something games this season. We like 14 and 9 when he's not there. So we think we can fare pretty good without him. Let's go see if anybody would take him. I didn't expect them to get the crypto nerd and then the shooter that can't shoot. Both of these players, Spencer Dimmy and Davis Bertens, based on their performances so far this season, are bad. I got a lot of love for Spencer Dinwiddie, and I hopefully he gets back to the, the verse of Spencer Dinwiddie before all the injuries. But this season, he's been objectively bad. Davis Bertens got paid a, a, so much money for him to hit a three, he can't hit a three. The Washington Wizards went from a team that was the number one seed to being on a free fall, and while they were scrambling, trying to get things, let's figure out what works now, Davis Bertens wasn't even getting minutes. They didn't even trust him when they were on a seven-game loser streak to get quality minutes. So you traded Porzingis, which, well, though Porzingis is a talented guy, like a really talented guy, this shows me he had no value across the league because of his contract and because of his injury history. Nobody wanted to take that on. And the one person that deals, you watch the Wizards, because in my mind, after this trade, I think they looking at Bradley Beal like, okay, Bradley, we may not want to give you the Supermax, but we do want to bring you back, and we're going to have you and Porzingis and Cal Kuzma, who's been looking really good, and this and that. It's a weird, it's a weird trade for me. Both sides is extremely weird to me. I mean, if, if I'm the Washington, I mean, maybe the Washington Wizards win this because because Porzingis is the best player involved. But bro, don't hoop. You feel me? He just doesn't hoop. I mean, I guess it is what it is. Watch. If if I was saying who won and lost this trade, the Washington Wizards won because they got the best player and they got. How, how did you convince them to throw a pick into this? If I thought that, listen, I thought the Wizards would be the one having to throw a pick in this. No, the Wizards got a pick back. 
from them. And they opened up some room by trading Montrezl Harrell. So, I don't know, man. I hope Porzingis can stay healthy. Because this season, if you remember my All-Star video, we, we briefly talked about Porzingis. Not that I had him as an All-Star. But we talked about, hey, hey, he's having a good season this year. And then he got injured. So, I, I, don't, I don't really know, dog. Montrez Harrell for Ish Smith and Vernon Carey. I mean, they just threw Montrez Harrell out there for nothing, which is fine. They made the Porzingis trade, and they still got Daniel Gafford, and they still got Thomas Bryant, so you don't need a fourth center. So they sent them to the Charlotte Hornets. It's like, we looking out for you, a another Eastern Conference team. Um, and, I mean, this trade is cool. Montrez Harrell was a good player, and we wanted the Charlotte Hornets to get better at the center position, but I would say went more defensive than offensive. Montrez is a crazy amount of energy. He's a really good player, just for former six man of the year. You know these, these things. Um, but I would have preferred that they went – Someone more defensive. Maybe that wasn't out there. Jacopoli didn't get moved or this player didn't get moved. So um, I was turning to get moved. So this might have been their best option. They upgraded that position for, for pennies on a dollar. That's a W in my opinion. It just wasn't the perfect perfect guy for me. But only time until. They're playing literally right now as I'm recording this video. Um, and I don't know how that's going. But I know it's going. Derek White got traded for Josh Rich and Romeo Langford in a 2022 first round pick. That is top four protected. Not going to spend a ton of time on this. So I like this from both sides. Derek White is a great defensive player. Um, the offense has been hit or miss this season. I think he's only shooting like 32% from three. Where like Josh Rich is shooting close to 40, if not 40%. Um, but it's a longer term deal for the for the uh, Boston Celtics under contract for some time. He's entering his prime at 27 years old, and I like this for the for the Spurs because well, he's 27 years old. He doesn't really fit the timeline as some of the other dudes on the team, and they already had a log jam of guards anyway. So let's throw him off. We get another first round pick in this year's draft. That's a W. One of the first trades of that Thursday. It's a big one. Marvin Bagley is going to the Pistons. The Clippers get Rodney Hood and Semi Ojale. The Milwaukee Bucks get Serge Ibaka, second round pick, I guess two second round picks. And then the Sacramento Kings get Dante DiVincenzo, Josh Jackson, Trey Lyles. I'm going to start with the Sacramento Kings, man. I, I really like this trade. Sabonis in his first game looked amazing. And everybody knew that Sabonis could hoop. If you take out the fact, and this is going to be hard to do because this is the big thing. This is a big criticism when it came to the Sabonis trade. If you take away the fact that you traded Tyrese Halliburton to make this trade, I like a lot the, the deals that they did this deadline. If your goal is to go all in for the play-in, get us a bonus, not a bad bad deal. Get him more perimeter defense as Josh Jackson. Get him more shooting and Dante DiVincenzo and Trey Lapps is good. When we talked about them um, a couple days ago, after the Sabonis trade, I was like, I don't see shooting on this team anymore. And they brought in Trey Lyles, who's a stretch, who can shoot the ball. And they, Dante DiVincenzo's hit or miss for sure, especially coming off all these injuries. But I think he projects to be a better shooter than he has been this season. And then Josh Jackson, I've seen him have really good games. I've seen him have some good bad ones. But I really like these deals, man. It sucks that you gave up Tyrese Halliburton, but if it's just, if I'm just thinking this season, I enjoy your deals, which is pretty cool to say for the Kings, man. There are a lot of teams at the bottom of this play-in that are going for it, man. Um, uh, the Kings are going for it. The Pelicans are going for it. The Lakers are going for it. The Clippers are going for it. Those are teams that are fighting for these play-in spots. So um, it's good for the league that a lot of these teams are making adjustments and making trades. And I guess you got that on the Eastern Conference side too. The only team that's fighting for a play-in slash playoff spot that didn't make a deal is the Knicks. Oh, no, the, the Hawks made a deal earlier. That was a Cam Reddish deal. But the Knicks didn't make a trade. You know what I'm saying? So the the Bucks have been questioning for the entire season about Brook Lopez and their center depth. And Serge Ibaka can definitely... Have bad games. Um, he's definitely not the same Serge Ibaka that was helping during the finals run a few years ago. But he can come in and help, man. You don't need somebody that's going to come in and play 30 minutes a game. Serge Ibaka doesn't have to do that. But he just increased that depth. And I saw that, that Brick Lopez is working out more and more every single day. So maybe he comes back before the playoffs. And now you got Serge Ibaka back there. And you got two second round picks, I guess. The Clippers did this to get under the luxury tax. They saved a bunch of money by bringing in Rodney Hood and Sam Yosley. Makes sense. And the Detroit Pistons getting Marvin Bagley is one of my favorite things to happen this deadline. Do I believe that Marvin Bagley is a stud? Probably not. But I've always wanted to see him in a new place. And we finally get to see that. And he's going to a place where he's going to have hella opportunity. Detroit basketball got a few things to root for. That's Kay Cunningham. That's Killian Hayes. And now it's Marvin Bagley. You know what I'm saying? I would, I would free up so many minutes for Marvin Bagley. Just go run, play basketball. Let's see what we got in you. Because if I'm not mistaken, they're going to have to extend him or let him walk very, very soon. So I like the idea that they took a flyer on the dude and it only took them Josh Jackson and Trey Lyles to make it happen. Torrey Craig got traded for Jalen Smith in the second round pick. Torrey Craig going back 
to um, to Arizona. Like this trade a lot. I would have preferred that they went out to get a guy like that. He's young because I said in my video before, I like the idea of a team being well-rounded and having backup options in case another team goes small. And I think they can still do this with a Tory Craig type dude, but that is young kind of fit that a little bit better. But I do like this trade for the Pacers. Go ahead, get that Jalen Smith. Get him as a lob threat for Tyrese because Tyrese likes throwing oops and get a second round pick for a dude that was on the last year of his contract anyway. So W. PJ Dozier <laughs> and Bo Bo got traded for a second round pick. Shout out to the uh, the, the, the Magic, because they got Bobo, even though he won't play for the rest of this season. They got Bobo, whatever. Daniel Tice is back in, in Boston for Dennis Schroeder, Bruno Fernando, and Ennis Freedom. And if I'm not mistaken, Ennis Freedom got, got cut. Bruno Fernando might have got cut too, but they said, hey, Dennis Schroeder, we might not buy you out, which I absolutely hate for you, Houston. Buy him out, bro. Legit, let these young guys hoop. I'm, I'm tired of tuning in and seeing the old dudes play over the younger dudes. Let's talk about the Spurs again because, hey, they walking out as one of my winners of the trade that last. Let's just say that. Um, Gordon Drogic got traded with a first-round pick for Thaddeus Young, Drew Eubanks, and a second-round pick. Thaddeus Young coming to the to the Raptors, really good idea in my opinion. I've seen a lot, a lot of people criticize as like, hey, they don't need more wings slash bigs. They already got this many dudes. But I think that's exactly what they're going for. They got um, a point guard at Fred Van Vliet. They got their playmaker in Pascal Siakam. They just want long players to play defense. And they got that again at Thaddeus Young. He's a locker room dude. I had him here in Chicago for a few seasons. And he was one of my favorite players when he was here because he cares. He cares. You know what I'm saying? And, and that, I'm not going to say that it's hard to come by in the NBA. But it helps. It helps. Now for the Spurs... Again, I, I just really like what they did this deadline, man. They get another first-round pick. They get Gordon Drogic. It seems like they're going to buy out. Just go ahead and get these picks. Go ahead and get these picks. Now, I will say, I will say, I think that picks may be a little bit overvalued from us NBA fans because because more likely than not, you won't draft the next superstar, but it's a possibility. And that possibility is good enough for me to trade that issue on for sure. Aaron Holiday for cash. I, I don't have any opinions on that, bro. I don't have any opinion about Aaron Holiday <laughs> getting traded for cash. And I think that's it. Those are all the trades that we haven't talked about just yet. If you want to hear me talk about CJ going to New Orleans or Norman going to the Clippers or DeMont Sabonis and them trade, go ahead and check out those videos I dropped on the channel before. I just cannot wait to potentially see Ben Simmons on the court in his New Jersey. I, on my flight home, I saw that he changed his number to 10, Ben 10, or 10 Simmons as I saw both of them going around on Twitter, which is dope. These two teams play against each other in like a month, almost a month exactly. I think it's March 10th, the exact date. I'm excited for this, man. Another big shakeup trade of the NBA. Another big shakeup trade. Now, let's start talking about things that we don't normally talk about around here. Legacy. Mm. Talk about the legacy. Do we want to do that? I like James Harden. I, I have to preface that because some people take things out of context. James Harden has played with some of the greatest players of all time. And he was talking about, or his camp came out about the perception of him if he if he requested a trade, right? They talked about the perception that we don't want to be seen as a dude that requested two trades in 13 months. Who cares? Bro has played with some really good teams, some really good players. This is the last chance. I, I believe, I believe. I think this is the last chance he's going to get. Because it just seems like every single stop, every single team that he goes to, it ends terribly. Dwight Howard ended terribly. Chris Paul ended terrible. Russell Westbrook, now, now KD and Kyrie ended terribly. And if this and the Joel B thing does not work out, we're going to have a real life conversation. Because a couple years ago, we were on a podcast. We, you know, so I don't like ranking players, but I, I just think some numbers are set in stone. We talk about the greatest shooting guards of all time. In my personal opinion, it is Jordan, it is Kobe, it is Wade. Anything after that is an argument, and I'm not having it. But we were having a conversation on the podcast where people were like, man, we're ready to put James Harden at number three over Wade. And I'm like, pump the brakes. If you're going off strictly talent in basketball, sure, you can argue that James Harden is more talented than, Wayne, than what Dwayne Wade was. But I think I'm having Dwayne Wade ranked higher because his ability to get along with his teammates and ultimately win. He has some good teammates in his past too, you know what I'm saying? We had the big old Shaq trade. That was a trade that was a win-win. A superstar trade that was a win-win. Remember that? The Lakers ended up winning the championship in a few years. And the Miami Heat won a championship really close. You know what I'm saying? Got along with Shaq. Won a championship. Oh, snap. Chris Bosh and, and LeBron want to come to my team. Come on, fellas. Two extra championships. And what can you say about Dwayne Wade? No teammate, star teammate that he ever played with is going to talk bad about him. Because bro was liked. James Harden has not been like bad teammates, dog. 
He has not been like that as teammates. That has to say something. That every single player that's really fucking good at basketball, top 0.0000001%, all the great all-star caliber teammates he played with, not many of them be coming to the defense of James Harden. Not many of them. I'm just saying, man. It's a conversation. I hope this works out for Joel Embiid's sake. Really want Joel Embiid to be one of those one-team guys. I know I'm projecting his career, and it's unnecessary. But he feels like a one-team guy, and I would want him to be a one-team guy. And it seems like Daryl Morey, as their front office, is trying his hardest to make sure he is a one-team guy by, by building around him or trying to put together the best possible team around him. You know, James Harden is the best teammate or best player that Joel Embiid has ever played with. That's counting Jimmy Butler. That's counting Ben Simmons. James Harden is the best player he's ever played with. And, and it might take them time to jail. But he's the best player they ever he's ever got as a teammate. Let me know in the comment section who's your winner or loser of the NBA season. One question I posed to the homies, and, and nobody had an answer just yet. Does this trade, I mentioned earlier in the video, that the trade of having James Harden on the 76ers put them in the upper echelon as contenders, like real contenders. Does the trade, do you love the trade as much to say they are your favorite? How about that? Did this trade make them the favorite this season? Let me know in the comment section.